Good evening, everyone. I'm Anne Havard, and I'm a member of the core group of the Scottish Laity Network. And tonight, it's my privilege to welcome you to our rearranged final session of our Lenten Journaling 2022. Sexuality and Spirituality, Challenges for Our Time. And our companion for this evening is Dilmut Amirku. However, as so often recently, our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Ukraine. So we will begin with prayer for them. And we also remember the people of Syria, Yemen, Palestine, Iraq, and all those who suffer war and violence. And today we also remember Bruce Kent, who worked so tirelessly for them and who has just died. And again, in the context of these wars, we remember the words of Paul VI, spoken 50 years ago. If you want peace, work for justice. Now, to remind you, the theme of our Gen Lenten journey was the body of Christ, blessed, broken and excluded. And we were blessed with companions whose sharing of witness helped us to see how we could seek justice for the LGBT plus community. We began with James Allison on the historical background. We then had Ruby Almeida talking on inclusion and diversity. And then we welcomed Richard Mackay and his friends talking on ministering to LGBT plus in a parish context and LGBT inclusion in Catholic schools with our companion, George White. And finally, because women have often been excluded as well, we had Gemma Simmons redeeming the women of the Bible and church history. And so that brings us to this evening and 
Sexuality and Spirituality, Challenges for Our Time. And we are most grateful to you, Diermot, for being with us here tonight, especially as you're about to head off to the States tomorrow. So thank you. And we're also delighted that Quest are here with us tonight. And we acknowledge that Million Minutes have also been co-badging this series with us. Unfortunately, they are not able to be with us tonight, but we have Jared Swan from Quest, and I now invite Jared to say a few words of welcome and to formally introduce Diamond. Over to you, Jared. Thanks, Anne. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to see everyone here this evening. Um, Quest is absolutely delighted to be invited by the Scottish Laity Network to co-badge this Lenten series, as, and I know that um, Beth from Million Minutes would be saying the same. Um, so I'm personally thankful to be introducing this evening um, the last event in this Lenten series and a little bit more about why later. Um, just a little bit about Quest quickly. We're a small charity with its origins back in 1973. Uh, so we are 50 years old next year. We're formed by a, by a group of folk responding to an ad um, inviting people gay and Catholic at the time to meet and explore whether those two things could be possible in the same space, in the same body. Um, initially London-based, we're now regionally-based, lay volunteer-led charity with five groups around the country, one in Scotland, one in the North, one in the Midlands, one in London and the Southeast, and one down in the Southwest. Um, since I last introduced us, our membership has been growing, so we're nearly 200 members, Quest members, um, and in our regional groups, we support a further 100, 180 regionally based folk who are participants in the life of the regional groups. So nationally, we're involved in advocacy work. We work in coalitions with both faith-based and secular LGBT uh, plus organizations um, on issues um, uh, that are in line with our purpose. Um, it's important, I think, to say that we stand outside the direct authority of the hierarchy, maintaining what we see as a healthy independence. Um, that said, we work with our brother bishops um, when we have the opportunity and with other diocesan groups such as Caritas, either openly or sometimes discreetly, just to support the inclusion of LGBT plus people within the regular structures of our church across the country. And currently there are seven diocesan uh, based initiatives um, offering that kind of support. We also run a national conference exploring issues that impact on LGBT plus Catholics. Um, and I've been doing that. We've got our 40th anniversary conference this year, I believe. So um, in the chat box, I'm going to put a couple of links. If you're interested in knowing more about Quest or Jock excuse me, or joining us, knowing about our uh, conference or just to find resources. Um, you can find stuff on our website and all our social media is on our Linktree account, which is also now in the chat box. More importantly, it's a privilege to be introducing Dermot uh, this evening, who's well known to many of you as a several, time, uh, several times companion and friend of the Scottish Laity Network. I think, uh, Dermot, you first facilitated the 2021 Lenten journey. Uh, sorry, you facilitated the 2021 Lenten journey, negotiating the Paschal journey today. Um, but also before that, the 2020 Season of Creation retreat, Gospel Discipleship and Ecological Sustainability. Bit of background information um, for you. Dermot is a member of the Sacred Heart Missionary Order, a graduate of Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland, and a social psychologist, most of whose working life has been in social ministry, predominantly in London, working as a couples counsellor in bereavement work, AIDS and HIV counselling, and in more recent times with homeless people and refugees. Internationally, he's been a workshop leader and group facilitator, facilitating programmes on adult faith development. 
as I'm sure many of you know, he's a well-respected writer and has two books due out this year in a couple of weeks, I think, in the UK. Pascal Paradox, Reflections on a Life of Spiritual Evolution. Um, and then that will be followed in September, I believe, by Beyond the Pandemic, Spiritual and Ecological Challenges. So this evening, Dermot will be exploring with us sexuality and spirituality, challenges for our time. And this is a subject which is really close to my own heart. As a gay man who feels dis integrated, someone who feels that my psyche, my spirituality, my sexuality, my sense of embodiment have been cleaved apart in order to allow others to live lives unchallenged by my difference, but also as an observer of the way in which our church fumbles badly with understanding the incredible beauty and joy that can exist when those components of our selves are truly integrated as I believe God intended, I'm really excited to be taking part in this evening. And it's, it's a, an honor to introduce you, Dermot. So Dermot, over to you. Thank you very much, Gerard. And thank you, Rab, again for inviting me uh, to be um, a contributor to this series. And thanks to all of you, the participants, to be with us on the journey. Um, I did send out a one-page resume, which I will be following fairly closely. Um, and also, I'm going to be um, following a number of PowerPoint images. So if you bear with me, I'm going to switch over to those, and then we will move from there. OK. So sexuality and spirituality worlds apart, coming together or striving to come together are, as Jared has just said, our desire to somehow bring them together and hold them in some kind of a meaningful uh, synthesis. In the overview that I prepared for this evening and that I sent to Rab, I write, having been split apart for several centuries, a range of contemporary evolutionary developments are recreating a new symbiosis between sexuality and spirituality. The sexual fluidity of our time, full of promise and peril, is poorly understood, both in the secular and religious domain. Re-education on a massive scale is urgently needed. So our inherited world of what's often called dualistic splitting. Um, on the one side, we have soul, spirit, the human being, and a lot of emphasis on purity. And on the other side, we have body, the material world generally, the sexual instinct, of, at least in the past and still today in some fundamentalist religions, being described as an animal instinct, and then sex um, in the more overt physical sense. And these are just some key words to highlight the dualistic split. Now, there have been many movements going on for the past 50 years plus uh, in order to build some bridges. And there's quite a lot of work still to be done on that bridge building, as I shall indicate this evening. So firstly, a quick word about spirituality. Um, and here I'm talking very much as a social scientist. So the popular idea of spirituality is that you're a person following a religion, and then if you follow it faithfully, you can be considered to be a more spiritual kind of person. I take almost the complete opposite view. And um, it seems to me that spirituality predates religion by thousands of years. So, here I'm talking about the formal religions, beginning with Hinduism about five and a half thousand years ago. And the three features that make a religion more formal is a formal creed, a formal ethical code, and a structured or formal uh, set of worship practices. Those would be the three main features 
spirituality tends to go outside those features into a broader uh, kind of remit. One simple definition, which I find very helpful for spirituality, is spirit with a small c, small s, connecting with spirit with the largest. And this is very much the thinking of the great Carol Rahner, that the human spirit is fundamentally transparent to the living spirit of God. And living spirit of God, as understood predominantly in the, in the Judeo-Christian context, coming from the book of Genesis on, spirit operates through creative energy. Spirit is the energizing source of the energy that, that co-creates throughout the entire creation. Now, quantum physics is a huge support, of course, of this view, except it usually does not use the religious language. Spirit empowerment is mediated in and through bodies. And this is very crucial when it comes to issues like sexuality. An example of that is, you may remember in the Christian gospels, when an evil spirit is cast out of somebody, and we're taught the spirit was roaming around seeking an alternative habitat. The point being made there is a simple but an important one. Spirit can't do anything with our body. Now the primary body the spirit operates through is the cosmos, the universe. Planet Earth is a body, trees have bodies, plants have bodies, bacteria have bodies and we have bodies. So spirit and body are complementary values. Whereas unfortunately, formal religion have often split them apart. And finally in humans, that energy is mediated primarily through our sexuality. This may sound very new to some of you. In fact, it's a view that has been around for at least a hundred years, except it, it doesn't get very high profile um, and often isn't even mentioned at all in several treatises on sexuality. I offer you this quotation from David Carr, um, a British biblical scholar, from his book, The Erotic Word, published in 2003. I work on the premise that sexuality and spirituality are intricately interwoven, that when one is impoverished, the other is warped, and that there is some kind of crucially important connection between the journey towards God and the journey towards coming to terms with our own sexual embodiment. Both sexuality and spirituality require space in one's life to grow. Neither flourishes amidst constant busyness and exhaustion. Both require an openness to being deeply affected by someone outside oneself, whether one's lover or God. Both involve the whole self. Finally, at their most intense, both spirituality and sexuality involve an interplay between closeness and distance. Neither sexuality nor spirituality work if one is seeking a constant high. Just as it is a mistake to expect everyone to feel a constant mystical connection to God, so also many people harm themselves and others through seeking consistently superlative sexual ecstasy. There's a lot of food for thought in that quotation and elements of it I will cover as we proceed this evening. Okay then, so coming then to sexuality in itself. Now, of course, we have been a sexual species for God knows how long, uh, not nearly thousands of years, but indeed a few million years, according to the best studies today on the study of human origins. And yet I find it rather frightening and deeply disturbing that throughout not merely Catholicism, but all the, the Christian religions, all the Christian denominations, and indeed all the major religions, we take our reference points around sexuality predominantly from this gentleman, Aristotle, one of the great champions of classical Greek thinking. And for Aristotle, there are three basic features that constitute and define sexuality. Men alone are sexual. They have the semen, they have the power of the seed. 
women provide the fertile ground for the fertilizer or the fertile soil for the semen to produce new life. And then thirdly, sexuality has only one purpose, and that is biological reproduction. Now, of course, nowadays in the more scientific world, uh, people don't refer this back so much to Aristotle. Um, in the more scholarly secular world, it's often explained more in terms of Darwinian evolution. So for Darwinian evolution, the whole idea is get your genes out there, get the genes perpetuated, keep the genes flowing, and the selfish gene of Richard Dawkins and people. Um, and therefore for that to happen, um, there's the assumption that it has to be a heterosexual couple, but their sexuality is all reduced down to biological reproduction. And this is where we run into some horrendous problems, it seems to me. So what you have there, what you're looking at on the screen is still the official teaching on human sexuality, not merely within the religions, but going right across human culture. Of course, um, in several discourses today, you won't hear it explained as bluntly and as explicitly as that. And that's part of the problem then. We're allowing stuff uh, to remain underneath the surface that needs to be brought to the surface have it named so that we can begin to change it. That becomes the major challenge. Now this Aristotelian split then, we can see it transpiring down through the, so I'm going to stay now with the Christian story and more specifically with the Catholic inheritance. So St. Paul has that dualistic splitting. St. Augustine had it very explicitly. Unfortunately, Thomas Aquinas, who did criticize Aristotle on a number of things, clings on rigidly to Aristotle when it comes to the matter of sexuality. Um, and it's, it's a real shame, really, that Aquinas uh, took directly from Aristotle and inserted it right into his Summa, that awful statement that females are misbegotten males. He took that directly from Aristotle. And then coming down into the Council of Trent, which I don't know if you're all aware of the fact that it was only at the Council of Trent that marriage was defined officially as a sacrament for the first time. Uh, and much of that, of course, had to do with trying to control the human body and above all control intimate, private um, human behavior. Now, uh, Christian marriage, then the teaching from the Council of Trent uh, is summarized in one sentence. Christian marriage is for procreation only. And that's taken directly from Aristotle. And then what, I don't know if you're all aware of the fact that the Catholic Church actually changed that teaching in 1962, saying that marriage, Christian marriage, Catholic marriage in this case, has a dual purpose the love and intimacy of the couple for one another, and that was put first, and secondly, the procreation of the species. So in the development of doctrine, and I won't go into the details of this, um, over the centuries, uh, we tend not to deny or delete what was there previously. Uh, we readjust it, and that's what they did in the 1962 teaching. And then what a lot of Catholics and others don't realize that much of the controversy around Humanae Vitae then 68, 69, was it seemed in that document as if Paul VI was slipping back into the earlier teaching. Um, that's why the document created such a furore at the time. But yeah, let's note 1962, many interesting things were happening in the 1960s, apart from Vatican II. There was a whole cultural shift in our understanding of human sexuality. Uh, and our church was right there, believe it or not. Um, unfortunately, in the years since then, I don't think this changed teaching has been given the uh, profile and the highlight that should have been given to it. Now, this quotation from Thomas Moore, uh, one time Franciscan monk, uh, yeah, Franciscan monk turned psychotherapist from a book that's quite a good read, The Soul of Sex. He says, we become inordinately absorbed in that which we neglect. And we display outlandishly 
what we do not deeply possess. This quotation is number three on your page. This inversion of values, full of paradox, is a pattern that makes sense of our extreme interest in things and our tendency at the same time to treat things badly. Now, I'll unpack what he's onto there because um, basically what he's talking about is the kind of confusion, the restlessness, uh, the disconnect that can happen uh, when polarization or binary opposites or dualistic splitting is not addressed consciously and responsibly. Uh, and it can leave us individuals in a rather painful place, but what he's touching into, it can do some horrendous things to our human society as well. And as a social scientist, I have a particular interest in that wider domain. So the uh, a few words in about the 1960s, this is when things began to change and change uh, very drastically. We heard about free love, whose freedom and what freedom was being referred to. Sexual diversity came to be acknowledged quite tentatively in some cases and was often portrayed unfairly and unjustly as anything goes. Let it all hang out became another statement um, of the time. Women's liberation movement, but it wasn't just the liberation of women, it was liberation being sought by a whole number of marginalized groups of people. And so liberation from what? Now, in my opinion, and this maybe is the most controversial statement I'm going to make this evening. And this brings me to the last point on the screen. What happened in the 1960s was the release of hundreds of years, probably a few thousand years of sexual repression. And so the lid was blown off the cauldron like the pressure cooker of centuries of collective repression and all hell began to break loose as it were. So what do I mean by that? If I'm a very angry person, and I can be angry about 110 different things, and I'm consciously aware of my anger. And so when I get very angry, I do have choices then. I can ventilate it, I can blame others for it, and I can somehow give it a, an appropriate expression to get it out of my system. In that case, I know what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with anger. Perhaps I don't deal with it very well, but at least I'm, I, I have some conscious awareness of it. That's suppression. Now I'm talking here about repression. And without wishing to be sexist, I'm going to take this example. Some of you have, may have heard this kind of story before. So a young woman is going out with Jamie. It's her first boyfriend. Every time he puts his hands around her and wants to hug her, kiss her, her body freezes. Okay, she's with the wrong guy. That's her conclusion. Let's get rid of him and take on Paul. But with Paul, the exact same thing begins to happen. And she's getting more and more bewildered about this. And so she ditches Paul and she goes for Simon. Third time lucky. But with Simon, the same thing begins to happen. And now she begins sharing tentatively with friends. And she's strongly advised to go and get therapy or counseling, which eventually she does. And that becomes more and more deep um, as it gets into some very painful and difficult material arising from her childhood, uh, through which she eventually comes to terms with the fact that as a child, she was sexually abused. And that's at the root of all her problem. So, up until that point, she's living with repression. The deep hurt, the imprint of the pain is so deeply inscribed in her psyche and so covered over, she's not aware of it. Um, and so the bringing you to awareness then means it's no longer repression, it's no more into the realm of suppression, so to speak. Okay, that's the individual, that's, I've given you two examples there at the level of personal behavior. Much more complex to come to terms with is collective repression. 
And that's what we're dealing with in a big way when we're dealing with human sexuality. For almost 2000 years, all the Christian churches have colluded heavily and fostered sexualized repression. And this is what was happening in the 1960s. The, the lid was blown off the pressure cooker, outpoured all the repressed stuff, and it's still pouring out and will for quite some time to come. And when repression begins to come out like that, there's no way you can put the lid back on. One has to deal with it. And okay, culture, life, evolution itself will help us to deal with it. And in a sense, a basic fundamental wisdom in the human spirit will also help us to deal with it. So the fundamentalist churches and some of the fundamentalist religions are very quick to judge in terms of the sexual recklessness that goes on in our world. That's only one side of the coin. There's also a growing emerging evolutionary sense of sexualized responsibility. I see it within my own family with my nephews and nieces. They all became quite sexually active as teenagers and they've had a number of different partners during their courtship years. They all cohabited. And those of them that eventually got married seemed, at least on the surface, seemed to have quite good marriages. I would see in that small cohort an emergence that's very constructive and that's very creative. I think one of the features from my observation is they don't have the shame and guilt that was around in my time. And that's a huge blessing. So when we talk about sexuality and spirituality, one of the great spiritual challenges now is how do we deal with the light and the shadow? Um, and I think we do need a, a, a good grounded spirituality to help us to do that. The light is where we are reworking um, things at various levels. Um, and then the shadow is the fallout, which is still quite prevalent. Now, in terms of the fallout, let me make a brief comment about the sex abuse issue within the church uh, and the uh, blame laid at the feet of clergy, bishops, et cetera, in that regard. And many of you are already aware of this fact. The research shows it over and over again, that horrendous and painful and destructive, though much of this abuse has been in the case of the Catholic Church, yet it only constitutes 5% approximately of all the sexual abuse that goes on in our world. And I find that disturbing and quite frightening. The first question that shows up for me is, why is human sexuality, that wonderful, beautiful, energizing, inspiring, tender dimension of our lives, why is it so problematic for so many people? Of course, part of the answer is the, the repression, the collective repression left over. So 95% of sex abuse has nothing at all to do with priests or clergy. And I'm not trying to make light of the people that have been pained and victimized through that in the context of the church. I'm just trying to get the bigger picture clear. Because no matter what we do within the context of the church, in safeguarding, et cetera, if we're not also making some attempt to address the bigger picture, the problem is going to continue. Because at the end of the day, our priests are human beings too. And what affects the, their secular colleagues will affect them as well. And again, I'm not in any way trying to justify um, or rationalize what's been going on. But I do think we have got to keep that awful frightening statistic in mind, that 95% of all sex abuse has nothing to do with clergy or with the church. Now, it might have something to do with the church, but not, not, it's not clerical related abuse. So human sexuality is a very messy uh, phenomenon in our world today, full of promise and full of peril, as I said in my opening thought. Right, we come then to some of the big questions and I can only deal very tentatively with these. So sexuality before Aristotle. Now, um, our, our, you know, most fields of research don't win there because they say, well, we don't have the rigorous scientific data. We don't, but we have data that is in itself highly significant, it seems to me. If you look at ancient Chinese art and Chinese 
iconography. If you look at ancient Indian art and the whole tantric tradition of India, which is my middle picture, and then look at something like the Sistine Chapel in Rome, where Michelangelo painted all the figures naked initially, and then some Pope came along and put clothes around the private parts. Also, you may be aware of the fact that about four or five years ago, the, the BJP party, the main party in India, um, I think there's an Uttar Pradesh, uh, wanted to draw up some government legislation so that all these images in the, in the Indian temples would be covered over, lest they would offend the, the, the tourists from around the world. My God, what a contradiction. So when we go back into these more ancient sources, what are we actually looking at? Um, on the face of it, it looks quite promiscuous. We're looking at two things. Human sexuality in this earlier wave was about creativity, of which procreation is just one small dimension. But more controversial and more difficult to talk about in our situation today, it was also about spirituality. In other words, if we want to enter into the mysticism, the mystical union with God, we do it through creating a range of mystical connections or mystical type connections with fellow human beings. Whether males with males, females with females, males and females, whatever it may be, obviously under ritualized controlled conditions. Now, it's almost impossible to talk about this today or even to reference it without being accused of promoting promiscuity and pornography. We are so locked into this inheritance from Aristotle that it is notoriously difficult to get out of it, get behind it, get, get into the deeper material. But if we want to offer any meaningful future for ourselves as psychosexual beings, this material will have to be faced at some stage. Unfortunately, and I, I welcome people to contradict me on this, I don't see much hope from churches and religions. I, I think as world governments would have to take this one on. And maybe we need to be conscious of that in electing our parliamentarians for the future. Because we will need new ethical codes. We will need a whole new some sense of human sexuality. And um, if we're to move forward, in a more constructive, creative way and do justice to this amazing creative facility with which we're all endowed individually and with which our entire world is endowed. Therefore, what do I mean or what do I understand then by human sexuality? Well, this is one contemporary definition that, that, that would be helpful. Um, and it's on your page number five. So human sexuality, is the sum total of my feelings, moods, and emotions as mediated through human interaction. So you see, there's no mention there of genital behavior. There's no mention there of sexual intercourse because sexuality is much bigger than either of those two dimensions. So it's the sum total of my feelings, moods, and emotions as mediated through human interaction. What do I mean by that last bit of the sentence? If I, a man, am having a conversation with a woman, I'm talking about an ordinary conversation. There is activity going on in my brain of a particular type, connecting at, at various levels of love, affection, intimacy, whatever it might be. But if I'm having a conversation with another man, there's a, different, a different, there's a different part of my brain being activated. In other words, every conversation is sexual because of its very essence. Let me throw in the other bit here, which is important also to hear for us coming people of faith. If I'm having a conversation with a significant other and I'm beginning to feel a deep attraction to that person, as a result, I feel sexual arousal. That is not Satan. That is not an evil force at work in my life. That is God working in my life. And let's be very clear about that. Now, what I do with those feelings is another question. This whole notion then of the feelings, the moods, and the emotions 
let me also draw your attention because I've just been uh, doing some research work on it recently. Uh, one of the pioneering figures of what's now known as the new biology is a German guy called Andreas Weber, W-E-B-E-R. And one of his basic positions is that instead of judging biological reality, biological life, whether in humans, animals, whatever, uh, we tend to judge it by dissecting uh, bodies or body parts and laboratories and so forth. He says, no, we need to move away from all that. And we need to judge aliveness by feelings, by feelings. We need to start asking, how does the tree feel? How does the plant feel? How do the bacteria feel? And that that's a far more reliable guideline to the deeper meaning of things. So I think maybe that's also helpful to understand this definition I'm now offering you. Therefore, the LGBT plus that I know has been the focus of several of these earlier sections, um, it's not merely about um, an opening up uh, um, for greater inclusivity, greater acceptance, greater understanding of people of different sexual persuasions, of different sexual orientations. It is also a cultural awakening. It's an evolutionary reclaiming of our long repressed propensity for erotic fulfillment. LGBT plus is a powerful cultural movement. Now, let me say here, because sometimes people have accused me in saying all this of not being sufficiently sensitive to individuals who are trying to work out those issues in their own personal lives. I would rather I'd stay with that personal material in a more loving and pastoral sense. I hear all that, and I'm glad that many people are trying to address things at that level. I also think it's important that to look at the, at the wider picture because relatively few people are doing that. And as I've already said, without, without attending to that, we'd all be suffering at the end of the day. So the, the, the synonym of LGBT is not just about new personal behaviors uh, related to gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, uh, and other people. Um, it's, a, it's also a cultural statement inviting this rather interesting um, slide of the different kind of flags used by different pride groups. Um, so LGBT pride, Philadelphia pride, progress pride, intersex inclusive pride, uh, polyamory uh, pride, pansexual pride, polysexual pride, bisexual pride, lesbian pride, gay men pride, asexual pride and so forth. Now, to me, all this is evidence of the expanding um, of, it's, it's all part of a cultural desire to open up and expand our understanding of human sexuality. Um, and and it's, it's very much, it reminds me very much of Teher de Chardin's notion of evolution, growth, change, and movement into greater complexity. Uh, one of the bits that, that troubles me personally in that list is this idea of the asexual, um, I, I see sexuality as so central to, to a human life and so central to our spirituality. I struggle myself to understand how people can claim to be asexual. Um, and I've met about five or six people making that claim in the past few years. So we may want to come back to that in our discussion later. Okay, this is number six on the page. So there are three central features here. In, um, to reclaim and incarnate anew the divine eroticism and that divine intimacy um, as the basis for a more expansive understanding of relationality, that everything in creation is programmed to relate. Now that's quantum physics fundamentally. Um, and so our human capacity for relatedness or relationship, um, I think needs to be seen within that context. In other words, relationship is not just about human beings. It's about all the creatures with whom we share the web of life. Secondly, a more wholesome sense of embodiment. As I already said, spirit can do nothing on its own. It's in and through bodies 
that the spirit works most effectively. The late Sally McFaig, the Canadian theologian, used to often use the phrase, God loves bodies. Now, unfortunately, that's a long way from the teaching that many of us were given um, in our early Christian formation. And then thirdly, a more authentic understanding of human sexuality, uh, which is what I've been touching on for much of this presentation. So what are we about? We're about naming reality in a way that will liberate a deeper truth. Because at the end of the day, as spiritual beings, we're always seeking deeper truth. And set my people free. We're always also yearning for the deeper liberation, our gift of freedom. So therefore, a few, um, number seven on your page, um, key points. I'm going to now at the stage trying to draw my ideas together. Let's try to become proactive rather than reactive. Um, in the face of this material, which is indeed very complex, I accept that. Um, but there is a great danger of reacting and often throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. Can we become more proactive? Can we begin to um, take some time and trouble to inform ourselves, become more aware of the bigger issues, become more aware of these amazing evolutionary shifts that have been going on, particularly since the 1960s? Um, and be careful not to lock ourselves into any particular straitjacket, heterosexual or otherwise. Secondly, acknowledge the legacy of, of the cultural repression, which is still around and will be for quite some years to come. Um, how do we deal with that? How do we acknowledge it individually? How do we begin to acknowledge it collectively? Which I would say um, requires forums where there can be greater confidentiality, safe spaces where people can talk, and uh, not merely about their bad experiences, but indeed about their good experiences too. I think we need to hear all sides in a meaningful adult conversation. Thirdly, broaden the understanding of LGBT to see it not merely as a challenge for individual people and an issue that is particularly important to growing minorities among us, but also as a very powerful cultural spiritual movement, um, highlighting in a very big way that the narrow, limited biological paradigm of heterosexuality is imploding and uh, will not see us through into the future. Therefore, a whole new paradigm is needed, requiring a whole new ethics, a whole new sense of human relationship, of marriage, and other things really big, massive challenges arising here. And they need to be named, and we need to find forums where we can talk intelligibly about them. Cultivate the capacity for adult conversations. Well, that's in a sense included in all the three uh, previous points. I spent some years working as a couples counselor, um, and it was quite disturbing. I'm talking now about married couples, most of whom are heterosexual. Um, but I found it kind of sad to see where love had become very stagnated, um, sometimes at own midlife, sometimes at other stages, where couples just were not able to communicate with each other. And in some cases, what came to light is that they really never communicated lovingly, tenderly, respectfully about their sexuality and their respective sexual feelings. They talked about having sex and making love, but in terms of telling each other what they found pleasing, what they found meaningful, what they found enriching, what they found flourishing, were, were topics they never really touched upon. And then finally, sorry, uh, encourage our governments and agencies to become more proactive. Okay, if you think our churches, certainly local faith communities, I guess can make some contribution here. Uh, but I do see this as a bigger challenge, or at least as as big a challenge for our secular world as for our religious world. And then finally, educate, educate, educate. Educare means to open things up. Let's go for that bigger picture. Let's go for this deeper truth. 
let's let's move beyond the narrow biology uh, with the terrible reductionism that has done us all so much harm. This quotation is down at the end of your page from the feminist theologian Rita Nakashima Brock. She says, the feminist eros. Now, it's interesting when Pope Benedict wrote his first um, encyclical on human love, he made this observation that I think in the opening chapter that the erotic in ancient times was seen as a primary characteristic of the divine and then became corrupted as time went on. Unfortunately, he blamed the corruption on temple prostitution. But that really misses a whole set of other um, uh, points that should inform uh, what he was talking about. Uh, and because he, he slided into that one without looking at all the other factors, he missed a golden opportunity uh, to really say something hugely important along the lines that I'm saying this evening. So the feminist eros en encompasses the life force, the unique human energy, which springs from the desire for existence with meaning, for a consciousness informed by feeling, there it is again, for experience that integrates the sensual and the rational, the spiritual and the political. In the feminist vision, eros is both love and power. And I have one final slide because unfortunately, a lot of the baggage we have inherited um, is taken back to the book of Genesis um, and some of the awful, um, dangerous and misleading interpretations uh, that, are, that are put on the book of Genesis. Um, I thought I'd share this one with you. This is a lady from Greece who is now teaching theology in the University of Southampton. And this is from her most recent book, The Anatomy of God. She says, beyond the bounds of the garden, humans immediately harness their newfound wisdom to do what the gods have always done. She's talking here about the imperial gods now. They bear children, cultivate crops and rare animals. They kill, travel, play music, build cities, forge tools, craft weapons and perform rituals. In covering their genitals, Adam and Eve reveal not their sexualized self-corruption, which is what's usually read into it, but their godlike capacity for the creation of culture. Now, what she's actually saying there is, the book of Genesis should be read against the background of the agricultural revolution, because that is the context. And out of that context, we see human beings being shifted more and more into a patriarchal way of being with the dominant male emerging. Um, and then, uh, so the creation of culture here in this quotation, what is the culture of power? It's the culture of domination. It's the phallic culture, if you like, which misses an awful lot of the feeling, the emotion, the moods, the other deeper dimensions that I talked about earlier in my presentation. And so what I'm saying there in a rather hurried way, Let's not take the book of Genesis literally. If we go in for literal translation, we miss all sorts of important points in that book. Um, and it's not, it, it really tells us very little about a meaningful human sexuality because against the background of the agricultural revolution, we were already losing heavily the, the pre-Aristotelian, more spiritual understanding of sexuality. And we were moving more and more into the biologically controlled way um, of being sexual persons. Okay, I suggest we take two or three minutes just for a stretch. Um, and then when we come back, uh, Callum, I think you're handling the discussion. Uh, so let's take about three minutes for a stretch break and then we'll come back. And perhaps in that time when you're starting to think um, you could begin to share some questions and thoughts and reflections in the chat area and we'll start quite promptly at eight o'clock. Thank you, Dermot.
Okay, folks, it would be great to see your questions coming in. I'm sure um, you know, this talk has, has stimulated lots of reflection and thought, and I'm looking forward to seeing the, the questions that are coming in. Um, so please share them with us in the chat area, and I shall put them there as we go on. So our first question asks, as you travel around, are you aware Dermot, of any church or civil organisations embarking on the kind of journey that is required in our understanding of sexuality and spirituality? The only church that I have met where I felt they were moving in this, beginning to move in this direction was the United Church of Canada, uh, which is, is um, an amalgamation of Protestant, of Anglican, Methodist and Baptist, I think, are the three in it. Um, and and it's, it's, it's about five years now since I had any direct dealings with them. Um, I haven't really, but what, what, what I have encountered more, um, at times I feel there's a tremendous fear uh, to even enter into the subject. Um, I also have encountered uh, people just don't know what vocabulary to use. Um, it just doesn't feel safe, or they, they're not quite sure how to talk about the matter. Um, so it's, 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 it's partly resistance, but I do get a sense, uh, and I suppose that's why at the end of my presentation, I was saying, educate, educate, educate. In other words, can we begin to invite people into conversations um, around this around this material because it's so central to the lives of every one of us. Um, yeah, and I think I think that's what's lacking maybe in, in many of our churches, uh, the, the forums, the 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 opportunities uh, for more adult open conversations in a safe environment in an appropriate way are not there. And then you spoke a lot tonight, um, dear Mid, about definitions and about different terms. We have a question here which says a member of my family has recently decided that they're non-binary. Mm. Does that assertion fit in with your talk tonight and is that something you could comment on? Um, now I guess non-binary I would I, I at least I'm, what I'm hearing out loud here is um, not sure am I male or female. Um, not sure that I want to keep the two apart. Um, I, again, yes, I mean, this, this is a feature of our time. Um, I, I've, I've met some parents, um, admittedly only a small number of parents were just scared that one day their young little fellow would come home and says, I don't want to be a boy anymore, I want to be a girl. Um, and apparently, um, and this may be one of the areas of tension with the European Union in the United Kingdom, for example, according to standard European law and practice, we're supposed to take a young child very serious there and go along with them. Now, um, I think this is material really for people of more adult years to have to deal with. And um, even for teenagers, I, I think adolescence is a period of confusion. Um, it's a period of searching. It's a period of exploration. Uh, to try and come down and say, no, I'm not this, I should be that. Uh, because again, many of yourselves will have heard stories of, people's, uh, of people that went through the full sexual reassignment and they wanted to reverse it later. And it, it, in many cases, it can't be done. Um, it, it's extremely complex. And some people would even say danger with surgery. So um, I think the whole thing of, of, of um, gender identity is, is a matter that requires, I would say, discerning wisdom and discerning conversation, um, not merely a purely rational uh, to and froing, but, but carried out with a lot, of, a lot of sensitivity and a lot of respect. But this idea that we should basically agree with what the person wants uh, and facilitate them the whole way. Um, now, you see, I think in this matter, um, how do we bring in parents? How do we bring in teachers? How do we bring in other people that are, that are closely aligned with the lives of our younger people? When it comes to people of older years, I think it's a very different matter because often they will have had um, opportunities to talk with, with trusted friends. They may have had some therapy and counseling. And I think they are probably much clearer about the fact that they are in the wrong body. 
and genuinely do need to change. I hope I'm respectfully responding to the matter there. Maybe return to that point. I, I want to take another question from the chat in the meantime, though. Um, we're talking about something that perhaps requires a greater level of honesty, and as you've spoken about, more significant and open dialogue. Yeah. Another question in the chat asks, would the honesty and discussion of sexuality be helped by clergy being open about their own sexuality? It could be in the context of churches, in the context of parishes. Um, yeah, but in, indeed. Now, an interesting one there is um, because I, I have had the privilege of, of, of doing small bits of work with some clergy people from the Church of England. I'm talking about uh, clergy people that were heterosexually married uh, and with families. Um, and as far as I could figure out, they were not bringing anything from that side of their lives into their priestly ministry or into their parish ministry. Uh, that was their private life. That was for the, for the vicarage, as it were. Um, so whether we're talking about Catholic clergy, a celibate clergy, or married clergy, um, I think in both cases, I think at the end of the day, it, it's something about um, each one of us in terms of our own personal journey, um, how comfortable we feel around our own um, sexuality, whatever be the orientation, or whatever be the, pro the process of unfolding orientations uh, that may be around. And then it's about who I talk with, trusted friends, maybe periods of, of counseling or therapy. Um, and it's, it's the kind of maturation, I suppose, um, that comes with all that, that will give each one of us and will give us collectively uh, some of the self-confidence to be able to communicate more meaningfully around the field. Perhaps taking that notion a bit further, we have another question asks, how can, or perhaps even can, celibate priests speak comfortably and knowledgeably then about LGBT matters? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think that they need to be um, comfortably, and not, they need to be comfortable and, knowledge, and knowledgeable about their own um, sexuality, um, and about indeed also their choice to be celibate and what that might mean for them and how they are um, handling that and managing that. Um, and then obviously in, in their communication um, with, with people. Um, one of the observations that was made after Humana Vitae uh, from some research that was done, I think in America, initially a lot of married couples and maybe single people too, uh, you just consult priests about Humanae Vitae. But then throughout the 1970s, there was a noticeable shift away from consulting with priests to consulting with doctors or family planners. And then as we came more into the, into the present century, there was even a move away from consulting with specialists to groups of people coming together and checking out with each other how they were managing things in their marriages. So maybe the group of women at a creche and, they, and having their cup of coffee in the morning. So I see this as adults beginning to trust each other as adults. And so maybe two of our clergy, whether Catholic or otherwise, whether celibate or otherwise, can we bring the adult into play um, in, a, in a respectful, loving and trusting way uh, would be one guideline I would suggest. But perhaps a bit more specifically, do you think that celibacy is a barrier to it? Do I think that celibacy is? Presents a barrier to that kind of knowledgeable, open and honest dialogue. It could, if it's not integrated, would be the short answer. Now, I said I wanted to return to, to the comments on, um, in, in reference to the non-binary, um, mm. the question around the, the non-binary uh, person. Right. Um, and I've got a, a response from, from Gerard which says, it's interesting that we accept children who identify as heterosexual without question, but question those who identify differently. I think this lends to a question about the need of parents versus the needs of the children. A okay. child who voices what may we might describe as a lifelong difference is not going to undertake irreversible changes for a long time. I think right. to point out that that stage on the journey is nowhere near surgery, is nowhere near 
um, anything of that like. Okay. By encouraging and simply accepting with the question heterosexuality, one might ask, is that a maintenance of some of the constraining symptoms that you have already outlined? Indeed, it could be. Yes, it could be. And so I, I accept the point um, that um, I think no matter how young a child is or no matter how young a person is, um, if they have the courage for whatever reason, it might be partly peer pressure or whatever it is, if they have the courage to voice this to a parent, to a teacher, to a trusted adult, then it does need to be looked at serious out of respect of nothing else. Um, and I would imagine um, if it's in the case of a teacher or, or a guardian, um, I would have thought to be important to bring the parents into it as soon as possible. But again, that needs to be done sensitively and appropriately. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share the comment from Gerard as well and then um, move on to another question because I think this comment's really, it, it certainly I found it very powerful in reading it. Gerard writes, in my own journey to re-embodiment and reintegration, I find myself rediscovering the small voice within the small voice that has been there since I was a small child, an innate inner voice. I've had to remove all those assumptions that have been made about the Gerard that people perceived and needed instead of focusing on my Gerard. I thought that was such a powerful way to put it. Mm. Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, Gerard. Um, I'm going to turn to Jim's question now, Dermot. Can you expand a bit on the idea of the spirit and trees and how that links in with sexuality? Um, right. Um, let me tell this kind of rather simple story. Um, and we're really entering into this whole realm of what we call feeling. Um, some of you indeed might have been part at some stage of the senior moment. What was the name of that famous community up in the north of Scotland um, some years back that which was described as a new age community? Um, Fintorn. No. Fintorn. Fintorn. Thank you. Thank you. Fintorn. And in the 1970s, 1980s, Fintorn went through a very interesting set of developments. Firstly, they, somebody noticed, or some of the people noticed, that certain types of music would enhance the growth of plants significantly. And that led them into a whole set of explorations um, around uh, the plants, around the vegetables. Um, and they developed a whole set of rituals that instead of going out to the garden and pulling out the head of cabbage, that you need to do it in, a, in a, with a simple ritual of acknowledging that the, the, the need, your need for the head of cabbage, for your nourishment, asking the earth for it and thanking the earth for it and so forth. And then they discovered, among other things, that let me change the, the example for a moment, the head of lettuce taken out of the ground. If it's consumed within one hour, you get 98% of its natural ingredients within one hour. If it's consumed three hours later, you only get 60%. So in other words, th there seems to be an immediacy in nature, in the natural world to give itself to us or to interact lovingly um, and respectfully with us. And it's at, that you know, it's at that level that I would describe um, a sense of, of sexuality. Um, the feelings, the moods and the emotions, uh, the, whether it's there in the, in the vegetables, whether it's in the tree, whether it's in, in whatever. Um, in some of these, these rituals around trees uh, that have been developed in various parts of the world, um, everybody probably has heard of hugging a tree or being hugged by a tree. Um, and of course, a lot of people will dismiss that as new age nonsense. But actually, trees are very powerful organisms. And the tree is one of the oldest symbols we have of the great earth mother goddess who it seems was a very sexually fertile uh, creature. And um, so th 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 the kind of, of connection we make, um, how we experience that connection, um, how we uh, allow ourselves to be touched by it. What I find particularly helpful <clears throat> at times is to put my back against the tree and imagine the tree kind of hugging me or holding me. Um, and I, I find that quite an enriching experience. So 
those are just hints that I'm giving you. Um, when we come into the whole animal world, we're, we're, in, a, we're in quite a different, we're, in, we're in, in, in a situation where we can connect even more intimately and any of us that have had pets um, or watch the behavior of animals, uh, seeking out affection, seeking out tenderness, seeking out care. Um, again, it's about going for the feeling as a primary quality. That, that, that notion from Andreas Weber, uh, the biologist, that, that I think is the key factor in, in what I would uh, describe as a sexuality related to other organisms or other creatures. I want to turn to <laughs> Dermot, uh, forgive me, to a question around language, because you've spoken a lot around reframing the dialogue this evening. Mm -hmm. The question asks at a simple level, how do we get the church to talk in terms of relationship rather than in terms of procreation? I don't know. <laughs> I wish I had I wish I had an answer for that one. Um, yeah, I, I, I now I would hope um, I don't know that much about seminaries. I've never worked in a seminary, but anybody today is studying for priesthood, if they're in touch at all with the, with the, with the reality of the modern world, um, I mean, surely to God, they must realize that there's more to human loving and human intimacy than just the heterosexual paradigm. Um, and that therefore for them as pastors to the people, uh, that they should at least be open to being able to make some connections and have meaningful adult conversations. I, I think if they're in denial of all that in their own lives, I would suggest they're causing major psychological problems for themselves, never mind for the people they're dealing with. And then I wonder if I can turn to, to the question then of you know, sticking with this notion of how do we move in that direction? How do we change? How do we challenge this? This is very far away from perhaps where the institutional church is at the moment. I don't think anyone would dispute that. We're very, talking about something that's very, very far away. How do we begin to journey in that direction? Can we change? Can we challenge? Can we ever do that effectively? Let me throw out um, a statement, and some of you have heard me use this one before. Um, it's from a little known French philosopher. We won't worry about his name for tonight. Um, it's a poetic rendition of a statement from scholasticism of all places. Action follows thought. And I think um, Anselm and Aquinas, whoever coined that phrase, they didn't mean thought in terms of just thinking. I think they also meant perception. Now, the poetic version of it, which I find more meaningful. When I change the level of my awareness, I start attracting a different reality. So once again, when I change the level of my awareness, I start attracting a different reality. In other words, I don't have to do all the doing. The universe will help me in it. When I change the level of my awareness, I start attracting a different reality. So whether we're in the church, whether we're in the margins of the church, whether we're not particularly affiliated with any church or religion, perhaps there is a personal responsibility for each one of us to make ourselves simply more aware. And maybe take the initiative of sharing that awareness with even one other person. Awareness is what contemporary science often describes as consciousness. Quantum physics claims that consciousness is the driving energy of all creation. I think awareness is very powerful, particularly when it becomes more integrated. And okay, we need others with us then to help to integrate it, hence the notion of the conversation. But yeah, let's begin with awareness and let's not apologize for it. And the good thing about awareness, no matter what my age, no matter what my health, are my limited energy, we can all give focused attention, we can all do a bit of reading, we can, we can read a web page or something, we can, we can contribute to a conversation, 
we can all help to shift the level of the awareness. Action follows thought. When I change the level of my awareness, I start attracting a different reality. For me, that's that's an important starting point. Emmett, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share with us tonight the conversation that we've had. Um, I could go on and on and on with the number of questions that are in the chat. I really could uh, of, of a really thought provoking nature. There's some fantastic questions there that start a really powerful conversation that I think we all recognise is so incredibly necessary. So thank you for sharing with us tonight. I'm You're now welcome. going to invite Gerard to say a few words. There, got it. I was trying to unmute myself, um, which I was finding difficult, which is quite unusual. Uh, Dermot, thank you. I was, uh, I find myself in spaces like these uh, at the moment with some of what Pope Francis has, has said in relation to synod and his emphasis on us walking together and his emphasis on us listening to each other. And there's something within that, I think, about walking without offence in our listening and trying to connect to each other. And I think in, in, in bringing that approach, we were able to journey further together. Um, and I've certainly come a long way this evening. It's lovely to hear you speaking about things that I have thought about for a long time and, and had very little resonance with in my church. Um, and that inner sense of these are desperately needed conversations. Um, I think the church, sadly, has put into little boxes so much about who these beings, our physical bodies and what's in them, are. Um, and in my own journey, which has involved quite a bit of therapy, physical therapy, as well as emotional therapy. I've had to deconstruct all of the garbage that I've been given about who I am. And that includes in relation to my sexuality and my spirituality. Um, and it's been a difficult journey, but a powerful journey. So as I say, having, there's been loads of resonance for me this evening. Um, so for me personally, I don't care what anyone else thinks. <laughs> I've got loads out this evening. So, you know, good night, everyone. Um, I, I, it really has been uh, truly inspiring. And I'm so glad that these conversations uh, are being had. We need to have them in our homes with each other. We need to have them at an appropriate level with our children, with our teenagers. And I have found such release in making myself vulnerable and then having other people make themselves vulnerable about this stuff um, and the freedom that it offers and the space then to explore that spirituality. So thank you so, so much. So, so much. Thank you for everything that you do and for, for, for carrying all of that work forward. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. So um, we'd like to finish by saying a prayer for you. So loving God, we thank you for the wisdom, the insight and inspiration of Dermot. We thank you for what he has shared with us tonight, for the gifts that he has given us. We ask that you anoint him anew, such that his life and his ministry may continue to be empowered by your spirit. Amen. And we close by praying for 
all of us gathered here tonight, that we may go forth empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we pray that we might go forth in the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Come, Spirit of Fire, in our broken and divided world, help us to burn with the fire of Jesus. Come, Spirit of Truth, empower us as such that we may live and walk in the truth of Jesus. Come, Spirit of Fire, in our broken and divided world, help us to burn with the fire of Jesus. Come, Spirit of Truth, empower us such that we may live and walk in the truth of Jesus. Come, Spirit of Love, and empower us to love as Jesus loved. Amen. Thank you, Rosa. And I'd also, on behalf of the Scottish Laity Network, Dermot, like to thank you for this evening as well. Each time you talk to us, you raise the bar higher. And so the next time you talk, we will be expecting so much. Um, and good luck for your airline journey tomorrow, going to the States. Any airline journey at the moment seems to be very difficult. So our thoughts will be with you as you go to the States. And I'd also like to thank Jared for being with us tonight and for the sharing that he's done with us tonight, which was very powerful. And thanks to Quest and Million Minutes who've been co-badging this series with us. And now, for some upcoming events. So on Monday the 13th of June, we have um, the Pax Christi ch um, challenging the hostile environments. Jared, do you want to say about this? Uh, yeah, so... Um... Quest is often asked um, how Catholic educators might support LGBT pupils, parents, and colleagues. Um, so Quest is ho hosting an event with Father James Martin, who um, has also been a companion with the network. And he's gonna join us in a conversation with Quest and Million Minutes trustee and Scottish Laity Network companion, George White, um, to explore the question, what does it mean to be an LGBT plus inclusive gospel led Catholic school? So if you want to find out more um, about how to participate, how to watch the video after the event, how to receive updates about Quest work with Catholic educators, then you can find the attached poster at the link which I'm just going to put in the chat box and I think the links usually follow after the event as well so um, there's the link there but it, it looks to be a great evening we've got 340 people registered so far we're really excited about it and clearly you know there are questions out there that that need to be discussed so come along thank you Jared and now finally, we want to draw attention to our Scottish Laity Network gathering, which um, we're going to have on the 23rd of June in the evening. And the reason we're having it, we're so grateful for your support over the past year. And we are looking for an opportunity to celebrate what we have achieved together to consider some new ideas and new ways of working because everyone has gifts and we want to make it easier for more of you to take part in making the decisions and putting them into practice without necessarily committing yourselves to being members of the core group. 
Most of the evening will be spent in breakout rooms so that everyone is heard and able to take part fully. So first of all, we look back over the past year, consider what went well, what we might take forward and where we might improve. And then we will look forward, discuss new ideas and new ways of taking part. So please join us on the 23rd of June and may the Holy Spirit guide us as we look to the future. And now, to those of you who are leaving us, good night, God bless, and please log off. <laughs>